Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Michael Claude. I'm the head of communications of the International Transport Forum. And this is our Ask the Author session with Olaf Merck, uh, the author of the report, Container Automation Impacts and Implications. Very good to have you all here. We have a 30 minute session. Olaf will make a presentation of about 10 minutes. And then it's over to you uh, to the floor to ask the author questions, which is the point of this webinar. Um, container port automation. Uh, if you read the newspaper, you can see that this is a very timely report. Ports have become choke points in the international supply chains. We read about it every day. Uh, the US president has changed the working hours at the port of Los Angeles to 24 seven to deal with the ships uh, coming in and the containers coming into the, the port. And that's only one of many ports around the world, with that situation. Of course, port automation will not be the solution. Uh, there are other issues with hinterland connections and truck driver shortages, but is it maybe part of the solution? Um, so this report is, is very timely. Um, and we want to look at where we are in terms of port automation. Um, we want to look at whether it's desirable under what circumstances and also what does it take on the policy side um, to advance it if it is then desirable. And finally, an important point is what is the impact on labor relations on the social dimension of automation, which is of course an issue that is not uh, limited to ports, but everywhere where automation happens. Um, I'm going to invite you to ask questions right from the beginning. Please do that by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat function, the Q&A. Uh, type your question in there. You can start right away. You don't have to wait until Olaf is finished if you already know what you're going to ask. Um, and then I will take those questions, uh, put them to Olaf, uh, and we'll hopefully have a li lively discussion. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and those who've registered but can't make it will be able to see it online. I'll share the link. And towards the end, you'll have a very short um, poll just with two questions, uh, whether this was useful or not, so we can help uh, improve this format and make it fit your needs. So that's my little speech for the introduction. And I'm delighted to hand over to Olaf Merck, who's our ports and shipping expert at the International Transport Forum, to take us through the main findings of the report, Container Port Automation Impacts and Implications. Olaf. Yes, many thanks, uh, Michael, and, and many thanks to, to you. Hi to you all. Um, I'm glad you are uh, interested in this, in this new report, Container Port Automation Impacts and Implications. Um, as Michael mentioned, there's a couple of slides that I'll, I'll show, um, a couple of questions that I'll try to answer first, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, you can ask uh, your questions. Um, my uh, first slide is uh, simply giving the questions that the report tries to answer, which is basically how many ports, uh, container ports are automated, um, why are relatively few ports automated? Uh, what are favorable conditions for automation? What are the current conditions? Um, could we expect more port automation in the future? Um, and then what are policy implications? And, and finally, what are our recommendations to policymakers? So I'm trying to lead you quickly through these, uh, these questions. First observation is that relatively few ports are actually automated. Um, from the beginning of containerization, uh, that's many decades uh, ago now, there were high expectations for the automation of container ports. Um, for example, the management consultancy McKinsey in 1967, more or less at the beginning of containerization and container ports, uh, predicted that, that all container ports would be, uh, would be uh, automated in the future. In practice, what, we, uh, what we're seeing now is that uh, around uh, 50, well, we counted 53 terminals worldwide uh, are uh, automated to some extent. And, and that is around 4% of the total container terminal capacity throughout the world. Most of them are in Europe and Asia, uh, a, a little bit less in, uh, in, in the US and uh, in Australasia. Um, most of the automation takes place uh, in, uh, in the yard of, uh, of container terminals. Uh, a third of the cases is also automating the transfer from the key to the yard. 
So that is where, uh, let's say, the, the yard operations are and where most of the uh, container uh, port automation takes place. Automation of, uh, of key cranes crane is, uh, is relatively rare. Um, and I put this um, between, between brackets because it isn't actually uh, really automation. Um, what we call automated key cranes are in most cases remote cranes, but this is also rare. Well, that leaves us with the question, why are few of these container ports uh, actually automated? Uh, why are the high expectations, uh, the beginning of the process not really fulfilled? Well, I think there's several reasons. Um, first is that the automated terminals are not necessarily more productive or more efficient. Uh, this is a finding from, from several surveys that, uh, that, that, that showed this. Um, Automated terminals are also not necessarily um, uh, less expensive. Um, it's true that uh, you don't have um, workers to pay, but, but then you have higher fixed costs because a lot of the automated equipment is more expensive. So it depends really on what kind of terminal you have, whether this uh, makes, uh, makes business sense. There's also limited evidence that automation increases safety. Now, of course, there has been a huge increase in the safety of container terminals, but um, there's not, let's say, a lot of robust evidence that this is uh, also related to automation. Another impact um, is redundant port workers and forgone tax revenue. Um, so if port workers uh, no longer work and not be reintegrated, there could be forgone tax revenue, and that has been uh, highlighted in some, uh, some reports. Um, and an, another uh, element uh, that, that we'd like to stress here, the automated terminals are not necessarily uh, greener, uh, which is something that has come up in some of the, some of the discussions. Now, what are favorable conditions for automation of container terminals? Um, a few points to make here. Um, we think it's more suitable for gateway terminals than for transshipment terminals. Gateway terminals are terminals that have uh, a hinterland with, uh, with a lot of captive uh, traffic. So that is uh, uh, cargo that wouldn't go to another port because it's very difficult to get there from another port. Transshipment is, is really uh, cargo from ship to ship where the port is just simply uh, a hub that, uh, that, uh, that helps transshipment. Uh, and for these terminals, uh, automation is, uh, is less, um, less logical, less appropriate, um, because a lot of transshipment terminals have a lot of uh, different sorts of flows, uh, which means that, first of all, there, there's less stable cargo flows, and also there are more ships with different sizes. That's our second observation. It makes more sense to automate if you have stable flows and if you have ships of similar size. And, and finally, uh, of course, it's also uh, more favorable to automate if you have uh, labor that is expensive or if you don't have enough labor. Now, if you look at the current uh, conditions of, of ports, what do we see? Um, Actually, we, we see over the last decades a development of less direct calls in a lot of ports and, and more transshipment. Uh, that's also related to the fact that there's more, uh, the chips have become much bigger. Uh, and this has led to, to less direct calls in, in ports. Um, liner networks have become uh, more integrated, also because liner companies have become much and much bigger and they've also. Uh, cooperate with much more than, than in the past. We also see more market power of carriers, so less stable cargo flows in ports, and uh, we've certainly seen more uh, mega ships, so also more peaks and more cross uh, of cargo uh, when they come to, uh, come to port. So if you look at current conditions of ports, uh, you could wonder whether automation uh, in, in, in many of them uh, actually makes sense or uh, is, is appropriate. Um, but of course, a lot depends on local uh, circumstances. The question is, can we expect more advanced automation? Is automation going to, uh, to uh, also go into other processes that we haven't seen or that we have seen rarely. 
I already mentioned the, the remote crane operators. Uh, this was innovated uh, in uh, 2015 in uh, the, the mass flux two terminals in, uh, in Rotterdam has now also been uh, introduced in a few other terminals. Uh, and so far there have been mixed result, but it has raised new questions such as uh, could this also lead to crane drivers actually, actually teleworking. Uh, so uh, no longer in the port, no longer in a facility in the port, but actually also do this from home. And also could uh, some of this actually also be outsourced to uh, other countries. Uh, another uh, uh, sort of uh, project where we looked at uh, where uh, automation has been uh, has been tried is uh, in the interterminal transfers. So that is the the moves between different terminals in the same uh, the same port. We looked at the case of the container exchange route in uh, the port of Rotterdam, uh, where the idea was to to organize this in an automated way but where in the end um, the port authority decided not to pursue that option also because a lot of the technology that they had in mind wasn't really available for the prices uh, that they wanted to, to pay for that. Now, um, what does this mean in terms of, of policies? What are the implications? Um, well, three points to make here. Um, what we noticed is uh, that uh, there is actually relatively limited insight in costs and benefits and alternatives of, of port automation. If you look at a lot of the different port automation projects. So there's not a lot, not a lot of information available on the assumptions of, uh, of automation projects. Um, and sometimes also the alternatives that, that could exist, such as more flexible labor, are not actually taken into account. Another policy implication is it relates to well, social relations, that is uh, between uh, workers, between uh, employers, and, and also, also government. Uh, and what we've seen from cases where automation was most effective, um, that is that this was where, where employers and workers actually cooperate constructively and where the benefits from automation, if they exist in that project, are also shared with, with workers. Another policy implication relates to the societal costs of, uh, of automation. Uh, these are not often quantified and also actually disregarded in discussions on board automation, but of course they should be taken into account. This leaves us then uh, to policy recommendations uh, that we that we make in our, our report. Four recommendations. Um, the first is, um, of course, we, uh, we talk about automation and that is a, a legitimate discussion, but it should also be more focused on flexible labor arrangements because that could also be solutions for, uh, for various ports. And that could be an alternative to, uh, to port automation. Second recommendation is to better identify the costs and benefits of port automation projects, make that information more publicly available so there can be a real discussion about the assumption of automation projects. Third recommendation is to stimulate social dialogue and also cooperation between employers and workers on, on port automation, um, because that would increase the effectiveness of the port automation project. And the final recommendation is about social costs of automation and how policies could also address these. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop here and uh, I'd be most happy to, to answer any questions you have on, uh, on this report or on my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, struggling with the camera button there. Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, that was hugely interesting. Um, I have uh, questions coming in. Keep them flowing. Keep them flowing. Uh, I'll make use of my usual privilege as the moderator to pose uh, the first question, um, if I may. Uh, I was I was intrigued by your um, example or your mentioning uh, the option of teleworking for crane operators. Actually, um, I was thinking of telemedicine, where we have you know very complicated operations actually being carried out as a distance from people in the outback in Australia or other places. So it seems that it's not uh, impossible. Are there concrete examples of where this actually happens where, where crane operators uh, work from home or even work from another country? 
No, as far as I know, um, this uh, hasn't hasn't been done. But it has been a suggestion that has been uh, that has been uh, what has come up, obviously, uh, now in the in this Corona period when uh, there was, of course, also in ports a lot of risk of uh, well of of, uh, uh, of of transmitting that. Um, and one of the suggestions was that if you have remote uh, crane operations, uh, that crane operators could actually also do that, do that from home. As I mentioned, well, what you see in a few ports is that uh, some of the, the key cranes are uh, remotely operated. So what that means is there are no longer crane drivers actually on, on the crane, uh, but they are in well, a different facility in, uh, on the port premises where they operate this crane with, uh, mm -hmm. with cameras, uh, etc. Yeah. Um, of course, it would be possible to do that in a different location. So the idea of teleworking for crane operators is not is not uh, ludicrous. Uh, that, that could, in, in principle, that could 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 take place. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of outsourcing this is, is something that has been well mentioned as as, as a as a concern in uh, by, by some of the, the trade union representatives in, mm -hmm. in Australia. Where they also have remote crane operators, um, that is in a terminal that is uh, owned by a, a Philippine container terminal operator. So the the concern was that some of these this these jobs would actually be outsourced to to the Philippines and go to uh, to the headquarter of, of that terminal operator. Yeah, I, I have a question here from from Nelson Coelho, who's uh, joining us from Aalborg University in. in and Denmark, and he's actually making the link between um, between uh, automation and ports and uh, the advent, if one can say that, of autonomous vessels. So his question is, how does port automation policy support relate to the introduction of maritime autonomous vessels? Is there a link? Is that something that will go together or are they separate? Well, I think that that is uh, difficult to say for the moment. Uh, I think what we have seen is a few pilots on uh, on autonomous vessels, um, especially in, in, in Norway, so that, is, that is a visible project. And what, what I think uh, is that uh, there it was linked to also to automated, um, automated port uh, equipment. Um, I think we're not talking about the same, uh, let's say, the, the, the same de developments here, because obviously ports are uh, already uh, automated, and, and it's on ports actually since since quite uh, quite a long time. Um, so, uh, you, I mean, that is not something new. Uh, clearly, autonomous vessels is is something new, where we're still in the pilot phase, where there's also a lot of other issues to to be to be tackled first, uh, including uh, issues of regulation and, and and how how would you actually do that? But of course, if if that would be um, a development that that takes off, uh, that could also mean that these vessels. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll also try to, 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 um, to have automated uh, cargo handling uh, facilities that, that are related to that and compatible. Another question, um, you mentioned uh, passing mega ships and the trend to ever bigger ships. Um, is that actually something that is going to help automation because there's volume, there's scale, or is that something which will make it difficult because the the peaks, how do these two things link up? Yes, these are indeed the two, the, the two, let's say, different, different movements that are operating at the same time. Uh, of course, if you want to automate, you need volumes and you need stable volumes. Um, so in a sense, if you have, let's say, stable flow of mega ships that are only coming to that, that, that terminal, yes, in that case, automation could be a good, be a good solution. Um, but the situation is different when you have, uh, let's say, uh, one mega ship uh, uh, every uh, every uh, every week, for example, which is the case in some uh, some ports, or even uh, if, you, if it is, well, let's say, not not regular. So, because in that case, what you have is actually peaks uh, that need, let's say, a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, cargo handling capacity at once, um, but also troughs, which means that at some point you actually don't need it. So in that case, is, um, flexible labor would actually uh, actually make more sense because there you 
you have, uh, let's say, less fixed costs, more, more uh, flexible costs, and you can actually put the, the labor in, in place when you need them. Right. Um, I have a comment, not a question, but maybe um, uh, Tom Antonissen of IRF, the International Road Federation, can, can turn this into a question. Um, and he just reminds us that the IRF will demonstrate an, uh, not the IRF, will demonstrate an autonomous container shuttle between two terminals at the port of Antwerp as part of the EU-funded Green Deal project, Pioneers. Um, that's exactly, I think, what you were talking about, um, Olaf, that it happens in the yard, basically, you know, moving around containers and ports, that's where automation is seen mostly, but less so in the other, other parts. Um, something that's interesting in this context is the question of, of environmental sustainability and if you're green, talking about Green Deal here. Um, I, I think I heard you say that it's not necessarily so that uh, that automation is, is greener than uh, containers uh, that are moved by by hand, as it were. Yes, no. This is this is sometimes some, sometimes mentioned in, uh, in in some of the discussions that uh, automation uh, well would make ports greener. Um, and I think what what is meant there is that uh, well, if you have a let's say a new new terminal, we have a new project uh, you, and you can, let's say, begin from scratch, of course, then you would be able to, to buy well automated and electrified uh, equipment. And that, of course, uh, would make you greener than other terminals. Um, but in itself, uh, it is also possible to have, uh, well, let's say, manually operated equipment that is, that is green, that is hybrid, or that is, uh, that is even uh, zero carbon. So in itself, it's not the automation that, that is making terminals green. I think it is the opportunity to actually buy new, new equipment. Here's another question from uh, Wouter, from Wouter Pietersma, from uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Waterways in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and he asks, why is there no policy recommendation to improve automation technology and to lower investment costs? I think that's a very interesting point because, of course, with a lot of other technology, talking about biofuels or automated trucks, for example, we, we uh, the policy is to kind of just scale up to make it cheaper. Batteries is another point. So one could argue that sort of big scale investment into port automation would also lower costs and enable um, the uptake. Well, I think the the answer to that question is that uh, th this is this is already uh, let's say a, a, a mature private market where you have equipment manufacturers that uh, well that that know how to make these uh, these automated uh, this automated equipment. Uh, so in itself, um, I don't think there is a need to, to 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 subsidize that or to facilitate that. Um, anyway, it is. I mean, if if ports or terminals. Uh, see that there is uh, a good opportunity to use these uh, these kind of equipments. Then, then of course they can they can use this, and they they do. Uh, if on the other on their hand, uh, it it doesn't doesn't make good business sense. Then then they won't. Um, so I, I wouldn't think there is let's say a, a market failure or there is uh, let's say a problem in the market that uh, that would uh, that is now constraining uh, port automation. Um, mm -hmm. And you would also expect that, I mean, if there are more and more ports that are using this, um, this is something that would kind of happen uh, by itself. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. This is a short format. We just want to give you a taste to read the report and then maybe engage with us on specific points that you find interesting and worth exploring. Um, but we haven't touched really upon the question of, uh, of labor which is always very important in the context of automation. And um, we know that in ports, it has long history. Uh, you know, when the container arrived, uh, the tallyman became superfluous. Uh, the profile of jobs in ports changed. And there's, of course, a lot of worry that this automation of uh, moving containers from the ship to the truck um, will have similar effects. So um, a lot of the unions uh, are against that. And your report mentions that there are kind of quite different examples of more confrontational approach or something where this didn't work out and others where actually some constructive approach uh, was found. So I'd be interested in to hear, hearing kind of what the mechanism then behind that is to find a consensual agreement to move forward 
Um, but I want to fuse that, sorry, with a question that Nelson Coelho has, has um, put again in the chat. And he mentions that the president of the US Union of Steve Dawes said recently that it will not work a container ship without a crew, crew aboard. And um, the question that he asks is, would uh, a generalized boycott against maritime automation also affect port activity? Yes, well, let's, let's start with, um, with the first question. Um, indeed, there, there are, let's say, various, um, let's say, di different local practices, you could say, when it comes to uh, automation and, and also the social relations. So uh, that ranges from, indeed, from, from uh, places where, where unions are uh, outright negative about automation to places where unions have actually cooperated also with, with terminal operators to, uh, well, to implement automate, automation. And the reason why they, why they did this is also because some of the benefits of, of automation in, in these places were, were actually shared with, with workers. So that, that meant that they were also uh, getting a part of the productivity gains uh, that they could uh, translate that into better pay for some of the workers or early retirement for some of the elderly workers. So um, it's not, let's say, a, a black and white uh, picture picture there. But what we what we see that's often, uh, let's say, in, in places where this discussion is more polarized, um, let's say, obviously, it's also more difficult to uh, introduce automation, but in a way, um, the polarization in itself also becomes a motive for some of the employers to go for automation. So in a way, um, uh, I think uh, a lot of the, the stakeholders actually have an interest in trying to, to depolarize, to try to well, constructively um, discuss about this and try to, to find, uh, find a, middle, a middle way. I think that is far removed from uh, the uh, the idea of a general boycott of all uh, all automation or on, on, on the maritime side. Um, and, but as I said, I think this is also, in a way, talking about developments in uh, in the future that uh, that that are certainly not there on the maritime side. So, um, well, I don't I don't think. It makes, well, I mean, it's, it's bringing us much, much further on commenting on, on, on uh, uh, whether it makes sense to, to boycott or not. Thanks. Um, although we're running out, I have a last question because that's also very interesting. Um, it's related to measuring uh, the benefits and, uh, of, of port automation. And it's from Tom Antonissen again, and he links it to the example that he brought up, the Pioneers uh, um, uh, project that they're carrying out in the port of Antwerp. And he's interested to know um, when they're defining the KPIs, re the key performance indicators related to this autonomous container shuttle, what should they be looking at? What is kind of, what are the measurements that will help them to demonstrate the benefits of such a such a automation project. Well, of course, I mean uh, it's difficult to to comment on on, on that particular particular case. Um, but I think the fact that you're already uh, talking about what should be the the performance indicators is is, is a good thing. Because what we what we've seen is uh, is actually limited information about uh, about this. Um, but well, in the cases that we have looked at in our our report, obviously uh, look at well, well, productivity. So uh, is is this actually going to to improve the the, the productivity uh, of, of the port? Uh, is it making it more efficient, uh, more reliable? And then, of course, uh, to compare that to uh, to increased increased costs, also societal costs. So these would be a few of the notions. Um, but of course, this is a kind of a specific a specific case. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't wouldn't be too specific about that. But I'm happy to to have a look at the case. Of course, if that if that could be of any help. But the messages do measure, do identify KPIs uh, that tell you whether it's working uh, or not. And if you find out they're not the right ones, then you know work on them and improve them. I guess mm -hmm. always a good approach, evidence-based. 
That's what we do at the ITF. I would like to thank Olaf, uh, our author. I would like to thank you all for, for joining us, for taking part in this uh, short webinar. Um, this will go online as a video recording on our YouTube channel uh, later today or tomorrow, so you can share it with friends or colleagues who could be interested. Um, if you have any questions that go beyond what we were able to discuss here in these uh, 30 minutes, then uh, please send us an email, send, uh, send Olaf an email or myself, and we're very happy to engage with you and you know take this further. This is not just promotion for a report, this is the attempt to start a discussion with people who are also interested and engaged in this topic. Uh, and you will just on your screen now uh, see a little pop-up with a question whether you like this or not, and I hope you have the time to um, to answer that and let us know what you thought, because that will help us to make this even better. Um, and I thank you all. I hope to see you again at the next uh, at the next Ask the Author, whatever the topic will be. Uh, we do everything across all modes of transport because that's what ITF does. Um, we're very glad to have you all here. I've seen colleagues from ministries, from the World Bank, from uh, newspapers, uh, from universities. That's great. That's what we, we would like to do, have a very broad conversation about the benefits, the downsides, the hopes, uh, what we can do to make things better in transport. Thank you all for being here and uh, see you again. Bye bye.